Gary and I are very excited to do Ophthalmology Off the Grid. Who, who here, who here uh, listens to Ophthalmology Off the Grid podcast? All right. Cool. This year, uh, we wanted to do something um, super special with a guy uh, who I've admired uh, from afar. I, I don't know him as much as I'd like to, and we're going to get to know him today. Yeah, I, this is, uh, and Shannon, if you want to just go ahead and come on up, this is a round of applause for Dr. Shannon Wong, uh, Austin I. Um, so Shannon, I think we, we first started communicating um, back in the ASCRS chat board days, the good old, the, the good old bad old days of the ASCRS chat board. Um, you're here in Austin, your partner John, uh, you, you both were pretty active on that. And for those of you who don't know, like before uh, social media and before Instagram and Twitter, there was this thing called the ASCRS, ASCRS chat board. Uh, it went away a few years ago. Uh, but it, for a long time, it was a nice community where people got to share cases, and that's really where I got sort of connected with Bill Trattler. And, and once you know Bill Trattler, everything else, you know everybody else very quickly. Um, but Shannon, you are always a, a, a voice of reason. You always had great advice about cases. You gave me some good advice about patients over the years. Um, and so we wanted to, you know, when Blake and I were we're talking about ophthalmology off the grid live. We thought, who better than Austin's favorite son, Shannon Wong? So, with that, let's let's uh, let's get this let's get this thing started. So, Shannon, just introduce yourself a little bit. Maybe give us a little bit of a background on your practice, about you know your your practice philosophy, maybe even how you got started in ophthalmology, if you don't mind. Okay, so um, I'm the uh, I'm an ophthalmologist in private practice here in Austin. I we do a lot of cataract refractive surgery, and uh, I'm I'm 55 years old, so I'm older than a lot of your parents. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah, I started in ophthalmology here in 1997. I've been with the same practice. Uh, I joined a practice that my dad started in 1969, and my dad worked as an ophthalmologist until he's age 80. He retired in 2019. He literally just retired just a few years ago. 2019. Unbelievable. That's unbelievable. What, was, what, what were the early days like uh, whenever you were here? Austin was probably a different place, uh, you know, 50 years ago. Talk about you growing up here. Talk about um, how was your, what was your house like uh, in terms of uh, if you have an ophthalmology father. I have an ophthalmology dad, so I kind of know what that's like. Was it always going to be medicine? Was it always going to be ophthalmology? Take us, take us back to that time. Uh, so Austin at the time, uh, this is 1970s, it was about 250,000 people. There were three ophthalmologists in town, and my dad was one of them. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we, you grew up, and I'm, Blake, I'm sure you, you know the ropes, but uh, ophthalmologists are generally happy people. And we would go around town, and people would recognize my dad and say hello, and they seemed pretty genuinely happy to see him. So you go through this path of, well, where am I going to go to college? Can I do well in college? Can I make the grades? Can I even get into medical school? And then you, you climb that mountain, then you go through medical school. Can I make the grades? Can I even get into a residency program? And then you, you do that, and then you come out and practice, and, and you, you start climbing mountain after mountain. And it really never, it never ends. So... You know, there's a lot of people here, and I, I have to just say, this has been such a fantastic group of people. Um, I have met so many wonderful young medical students, residents, early career physicians. Um, so as, as you look out over this, you know, group of future ophthalmologists and leaders, you know, you navigated each one of those milestones, and I'm sure there were challenges along the way. What, what are some of the challenges that you faced during your journey of not knowing if you're going to get into medical school, not knowing if you're going to get a residency that maybe would resonate with some of the people who are, you know, aspirational ophthalmologists out here. I mean, everybody knows you have to do well academically. That's what I call academic currency to get to the next level because numbers do matter. Uh, but if I had to go back, um, what I would learn more about is... Uh, leadership of other human beings had evolved to be a, 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 uh, the best possible human you can be by studying other people, uh, your, your professors, your boss, your academic attendings if you're in medicine, 
and kind of uh, acquire the great qualities, character attributes that these people have. And then you're also going to meet the other end of the spectrum of people who are, who are great role models of what you shouldn't do and learn from those people too. Yeah, the, ca- the counter examples and the examples. Um, I know leadership is a a key area that you that, that we share you know in terms of our interests and we, we both have a an author that we both like uh, Jocko Willink um, I know you've had the opportunity to actually go and and, and sort of study under him at, at some conferences and I know you're a big fan of his philosophy but will you explain your leadership philosophy I mean as a as a leader in ophthalmology I mean you, you run a practice you're taking care of yourself your family your kids your practice your partners you know each ring Will you explain a little bit about your leadership philosophy and, and maybe even in the context of how uh, Jocko Willink and extreme ownership has influenced some of those ideas? It's, it's about checking your ego always. So approach everything from a humility standpoint. Um, try to make everybody around you better. Put others before yourself. Uh, and that's part of just being a considerate human being. Um, so every day I realize that I can only be as productive as the team around me. So I think one thing that I, I don't hear in medicine is the creation of teams in medicine that act as force multipliers to make the healthcare entity that each of you will be um, more impactful over your life. So if you can learn to work with other people, communicate well with them, understand them, uh, set a good example for them, but um, it's, it's a lot of like self-reflection always, um, and then thinking about the needs of others. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, one, one fun thing about this season of Off the Grid, if, if those of you have been following along, is it's been all about business. How do you grow your business? How do you grow your brand? Uh, and I can't think of a better example of you when we're talking about that. Um, but I bet you it wasn't always like that. I'm curious if you have a mistake uh, or, or a bad decision that, uh, business-wise that you've made and perhaps something that you did really good that you're proud of. What's a, what's a great decision that you made that, that you're happy about and what's a mistake that you wish you could take back? Yeah, I've made so many mistakes. I would say the first 15 years of my career were kind of a mistake. <laughs> um, oh, this, this is expand on that. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I've learned a lot. I, I, I mean, my, my, I joined my dad, and he had his style and his philosophy, and I grew up with my parents. And they had a lot of positive attributes, but I didn't realize how much wasted potential I had. Um, so I thought of my, I, I was very much a, I'm a self-sufficient person. I can do everything myself. I don't need the help of others. And I had to look beyond that, get over myself and learn that I, uh, there were certain moments where I, I, I would visit another practitioner, another ophthalmologist who was just crushing it, doing so much more. Uh, they were so much more productive than I was. And I just analyzed it and I go, oh, it's because he's not doing everything himself. He's actually created a team around him that allows him to be more efficient. But in order to create a team around you, you have to um, understand how businesses are run and how people operate and, and develop an organizational chart and define the roles and responsibilities that you need to have in your organization to succeed. And then that's a whole nother art of hiring, recruiting talented people, uh, compensating them well to retain them, and then growing the business so they, they don't feel like they're their lives are stagnant because everybody wants to grow. You gave us that timestamp of 15 years. So, so what changed, uh, or or what was what's a what's a great decision? What's one of the best business decisions that you've made? Uh, how have you how are you able to start to shape your practice after? I mean, we had a good foundation. We had an ASC, a one OR ASC, which is huge. If you're in cataract refractive, or even if, in my opinion, you're in any ophthalmology space, having an ASC is crucial pretty much doubles your productivity. Um, yeah, I learned that I need to form a team around me. And uh, then we, we also 
uh, we used to do our own marketing, and we've tried every marketing media. I mean, we've done print media, magazines, newspaper, billboards, radio. But then, <clears throat> just like somebody was talking, I think it was you guys were talking about earlier, you, you hire people, Reeves, Rob Melendez, you hire consultants. So I, I realized, well, um, we got a lens, we got a femtosecond laser for cataract surgery in 2012, and we were early adopters of this type of stuff. And we used to do all our marketing kind of homegrown. And, and then, I, so I, I looked for a marketing person back in that era, 2012, and there were certain companies who did marketing, but then I, I they, they would market for like Southwest Airlines and then a, a local shoe company and then they would incorporate healthcare. But I found a guy who does marketing, not for just medicine, they do marketing for cataract and fractive surgery. And I go, oh, and I looked at their stuff and I go, oh, I could never do what they do because that's just so next level. And so that opened the door to how to market. I think that's a really interesting thing. And as, as ophthalmologists, medical students, residents, you know, it's a double-edged sword of being a capable person who's willing to take on challenges because you do start thinking, you know, I can probably do all this myself and I can do it better than anybody else can. But like also Dr. Dell said earlier today, you run out of time and, you know, time is going to be your most precious commodity. So how do we, you know, how, <clears throat> How did you make that decision? Was it a burnout at 15 years? Were you starting to feel burned out? Were you starting to feel like I've got more to give, but I, there's, there's a block here? Because I think a lot of times, you know, there, people feel trapped in a certain area and they're blocked. Like, what was the thing that made you sort of just like break through that block? I've got, I've got to do it all myself and actually take the risk and change. As a resident, you, as a medical student, you do the history, physical review of systems, et cetera. As a resident in ophthalmology, you do a comprehensive eight-point eye exam, et cetera. You do everything. And that's how I trained, and that's how I practiced for, for the, at least the first decade. Yet yeah, we did a lot of LASIK when I was starting out, so that was our bread and butter. I did very low-volume cataract surgery. Um, but I realized the most productive, Productive practices, uh, the best use of an ophthalmologist's time financially is, set, is doing cataract refractive surgery. So then when I saw that, I go, well, I only have one life. Do I still want to keep refracting? Do I still want to do all these things that I was doing, contact lens fitting, et cetera? I go, no, I, I really can be most productive in the operating room. So I formed a team around me. We hired optometrists. We hired a lot of technicians. We enabled our technicians to do a lot. They're basically phys physician extenders in our practice. So yeah, now my, I don't see regular eye exams. I don't want to see emergencies. I don't, do, I don't follow glaucoma patients. I don't see diabetic routine eye exams. My only patients I see, and we screen these on the front end, are patients who want surgery or we've done surgery on them and we're managing them postoperatively because they're not quite happy. So it's a very narrowly focused use of my time, but it's the single most productive use of my time as an ophthalmologist. Talk about your family a little bit more. So those of you who've seen some of the slides, uh, I think it was Jane from earlier, you know, uh, the ophthalmology department here is, is named after the, the Wong family. Um, the philanthropy uh, that y'all have done, the success that your family has achieved, not in ophthalmology, of course ophthalmology, but, but other things, real estate, other things. How, how did that come along and, and how involved are you in philanthropy locally? Um, talk a little bit about that. I remember I was at like a, a fundraising event with, ah, oh gosh, he was a, he was a professional athlete. And this was like 15 years ago. And um, he said, the one thing I regret is I didn't start my philanthropy earlier. And I, that just, I remember that. And then we all grow up and we, we go to college and we see things that are named after people. Um, and then we go to medical school and you see that too. And, uh, you know, as... As a younger ophthalmologist, I was just grinding away, trying to pay off my house, uh, get a car, all those things. But if you keep applying uh, a lot of discipline, a lot of hard work, you'll build a financial base if you can think like a business person. 
Um, <clears throat> my, my dad basically did that all his career, and he used um, a lot of his business sense to invest in real estate. And so uh, he, he would continue to invest in real estate. Um, I, I was doing well uh, in the business, and so I started investing as well. And um, at a certain point, I remember they were going to open a medical school here at the University of Texas at Austin. And I said to my dad, I said, you know, you've got enough stuff. I'm going to have enough stuff. Why don't, we, why don't we donate to the medical school to create an ophthalmology department? Because that would be pretty cool. And so basically, that's what we decided to do. Um, and I'm sure we'll continue to do that over the course of my life. And, and uh, that's what we do. So we've created an ophthalmology department. We have three residents, and we've matched our second group of three residents. Uh, so our first group of residents is in their first uh, PGY1 year. Uh, we have five faculty that are full time. Um, I, my priority is my private practice, but I do work kind of behind the scenes with um, our ophthalmology department. One other thing that I've I've enjoyed um, as I've gotten to know you and have, have sort of followed you in, in your career is some of your educational videos that you've made um, on YouTube. I, I don't know this. I think that they're probably among the most popular videos for patients to watch. I, Blake and I do a lot of things for our colleagues and educating you know each other and but you've really taken this more towards patients and I think it's a very unique. Can you just talk a little bit about like what led you to go to YouTube and, and, and make these videos that are more patient facing and can you talk about how that's helped your practice and what kind of reception you've gotten from patients who've come in maybe because they've seen your YouTube videos? Yeah, it was kind of by accident and so it was around 2010. I remember I was watching Uday Devgan and he was creating videos around that time and I sent him an email, I said, how do you, how do, you do that? And he kind of explained it a little bit. And my kids at that time were younger and they were watching a lot of YouTube. And so I thought, well, maybe I can create some videos, some vlogs. Uh, there's a YouTuber named Casey Neistat and they really liked him. So I go, well, maybe I'll create some videos, but I'll do it in a world where other people aren't making videos about eye surgery. I'll make them about eye surgery. And then it morphed into, well, I'll, I'll do it to educate our patients. And then I'll do it to educate our staff. And then I, I went down this rabbit hole of, hey, this is kind of like a creative writing. So I would write the script. And it's, it incorporates technology. I would, I, would, I would get better and better video cameras. And then I learned it's, it's about audio. Audio is in, as important as video when you create a video. And then it's production quality. And, um, somehow the YouTube algorithm will eventually recognize it and it's taken on a life of its own. It's, re it's really, I, I do it because I enjoy it. I, I don't do it, I, I do it for education. Um, and if anybody can benefit from it, I think that's cool. Um, I'm not the type of guy that goes like and subscribe. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, Smash that like button. <laughs> but it, it, it has created a, an, an interesting effect in that I, I literally see people from all over the world coming to see me every day because they said, I saw you on YouTube. And I, I don't usually dig into it, I, but I don't even know what resonated with them. I, I, I don't understand it. Well, I, I think it's the content itself. I mean, it's, it's so topical. I remember when the Symphony Lens was launched, you know, uh, you know it was just massive uh, that this surgeon would not only be going through their, their lens replacement surgery, but also document it uh, like you did. And, you know, it's got hundreds of thousands of views because all around the world people were trying to figure out, hey, how do we make this lens work? Uh, what, are the, what should we expect? And, oh, wow, well, here's a, here's a very well-known surgeon who had it on his own eye and, and is taking you through it. And similarly, when, you know, new lenses come out, you know, the new lens euphoria uh, comes out, and I'm like, I wonder how this compares to this. I bet you Shannon Wong has looked at that, and I literally, like, type it into YouTube, and yep, there he is, comparing, you know, panoptics to whatever, you know, and so you pick the right content, you pick what we're all thinking about and talking about, and you do it in such a good way. Uh, I think that's what, what drives us, at least, and patients probably feel the same way. They're wondering which lens I should get. 
Yeah, and so to that end, how what is your process like when you have a cataract consult? This may be for a little bit more like seasoned ophthalmologists, but I'm, I'm curious myself, so I'll ask the question. You know, all the time when we get cataract consults, we're trying to figure out how do we push education to them before they come in? How do we educate them so that they know uh, what the difference is potentially between d- lenses, even the difference between near and intermediate and distance vision? Are you doing, are you sending them links? Are you sending them surveys? And then how does that process translate when you're com- when they're coming into the office? Are you, uh, what's your education process in counseling patients for, for surgery? For a patient who's never been to our office? Yeah, a new patient's <clears throat> coming in for a cataract consult, for example. Uh, well, we have some, I've made some videos, and um, our staff will usually email the patient and send them a link to um, certain videos. And then internally, you know, there's a lot of, we go through a lot of the similar discussions. Hey, this is an eye, this is the cornea, this is the lens, this is how the, the eye focuses a picture, and this is how our lenses change over our lifetime. Well, I thought, well, why do we have to keep saying that? Why don't I just create a video and present it to the patient, make it clear, concise, simple. Um, for our surgical center, um, they all get a, uh, an informative video that tells them what to expect before surgery, what to expect after surgery, what's normal. So they all know that after cataract surgery, it's normal to be a little blurry, to see a little shadow out to the side, and their eye may be a little red, and their vision will be blurry the first day or two, and then it gets better. So I'm answering all the questions to actually make our practice more efficient and save us time. Um, Yeah, I mean, in the old days, we were told, hey, you've got to find the patient and then mail them all this stuff. I never mailed people stuff, but we, we use email and text messaging to give them information so they're more informed walking in. And then we, we also lead them to our web, website, which has video content on it. We tell them, go to this page, go to that page. So the more informed a patient is before they come in, the easier it is for them to make a decision once they're there. It's almost like if you want to buy another iPhone 15, the, you want to know what's the difference between a iPhone 15, iPhone 14, iPhone 12, iPhone 12 Pro, et cetera. So you just want a chart that makes it easy so you can make a, a purchasing decision. Well, in, in the eye care world, to make a surgical decision, it's basically the same thing. Um, so present that information such that when they come to the office, this is, this is like practice business stuff, that they can make a decision on the spot, that they don't have to go, hmm, let me go home and think about it and I'll call you back. They're, you, they're in, out, done. And I want to ask a personal question regarding family business, you know, because I'm in a family business, you're in a family business, and sometimes family business is tough business, you know. So, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, you know, you're so lucky that you had family involved. You kind of knew the secret password of ophthalmology early on. And, yes, there is a lot of benefit. But what I found, at least, when I was starting out in my practice is it, it, it was actually more difficult because I felt the need uh, to prove myself that much more. I wanted to exceed everything that, that, that you know, my dad and my uncles had, had done because I didn't want to feel, um, you know, that I'm just entitled to all this. I wanted to kind of prove it. I wanted to show it. Um, and that, that can be a weight. It can be a bit of a burden, um, you know, to, to, to do that. Did you kind of struggle with that, finding your, your spot? And, 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 you know, how is it working with family? I, I think that's to your credit. Um, because, I mean, I think I told you this saying, there's a, there's a saying I, I, tell, I tell my son, uh, who's, who's in college, but I, I, I tell him, I said, uh, uh, there's a saying that uh, good times make weak men, weak men make hard times, uh, hard times make strong men. So I, it, it's, it's very easy to be the beneficiary of, I guess, the woke term is privilege, and to kind of coast. But uh, I, I, I mean, when I when I joined the practice, yeah, I think there was the perception of oh, there there he is. He's born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Um, but I mean, I, I we don't get to where we are without a lot of hard work and a lot of discipline. So I mean, I it's everybody's wired differently, but I. I was very driven. I'm still very driven. So I just, you know, you have to fight through that and prove yourself. But you have to prove yourself every day. So they, they as, 
it's like there's a saying, the only easy day was yesterday. Every day you're in the, in the practice, you're being scrutinized as a leader. You're being scrutinized as a doctor. So you really have to prove yourself every single day. Just because you were great yesterday doesn't mean you're great today or tomorrow. Yeah, and sometimes scrutinized unfairly, you know, and you have to be cognizant of that as well. And and uh, and you can't complain about it because nobody wants to listen to us complain. You know, that's why we're in the position we are. You know, and so having to kind of overcome that, I think, is is important. You mentioned your your sons. I have three sons. You have three sons. You know, talk about that piece. Have you? You know, I, I'm just now getting to the point. My boys are eight, four, and three. I'm trying to learn how to be a better dad and a better father. I got to say, sometimes the dad stuff doesn't come natural to me. You know, the reading to them when they go to bed and driving them to school. I'm like, man, I kind of just wish I was you know, hanging out, you know, having a glass of wine with my wife right now, but I'm having to put the kids to bed. But after I do it, I'm like, that was a good thing to do. I'm glad I did that. You know, I'm trying to learn how to do that. Um, you know, have you, have you kind of gone through that because you've been so busy, you know, your whole life? How did you, how did you raise three young men? Um, well, I'm blessed with like a great wife. <laughs> so answer. when I was, when our kids were very, very young, um, I, I was there, I was present, um, but my wife was full time with them. Um, and as they get older, you, yeah, I make it a point. I, I did, I was intentional in being a present parent. Um, and it, kids are very endearing up until probably the age of 12 to 13, and they want you to be around. Um, and then for those of you who, this is in your future, and Gary probably knows, after the age of 13, they, they kind of want their independence. And by the time they're about 16, and especially if they have a car, they, they, don't, they don't know who you are. <laughs> and so they go through stages, and it's just part of the normal thing. But you, you do your best in those foundational years to be... Uh, the best role model you can, and you hope it sticks. Yeah. And then I'm sure you know, as a you know, as a father, I think about you know the things my dad told me, and I'm sure you probably went through that same thing. Did your dad give you any good advice growing up that you've been able to pass on to your kids, or something that was that, that stuck, um, something that resonates with you? Pay your taxes, tip your bartenders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my dad's very much into business. He 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 wants to pay as little taxes legally possible. <laughs> so run your businesses that way. Um, no, I mean, just what he said an example. He, he set a good example uh, by just working hard and uh, taking, taking good care of the business and, and providing for his family. And, and Shannon, I want you to talk about your new center because I did the drone flyby thing. So he made this amazing video, drone footage, going through your new center, which is beautiful. Uh, maybe just kind of, you know, these last few minutes that we have, just kind of talk a little bit about, you know, building that new center, the new ASC, and, and maybe what the future is. So, so you said you're 55. You know, what's, what, what's, what's the next 10, 15 years look like for, 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 your, uh, for, for Austin I? Yeah, so the drone footage, there was a, um, there's a TV series on HBO called Hard Knocks, and it's about football. And a few years ago, they had a, a, a season about the Dallas Cowboys. So th the introduction to that season was a drone fly through the Dallas Cowboys practice facility. And I go, oh my God, that's awesome. And then there was, around the same time, there was this very viral bowling alley drone video. And then about a year or two ago, there was another uh, viral video flying around the Chicago Cubs Wrigley Field. And I remember those. And so it was New Year's Day this year. I was sitting at home, nothing to do. And I was, I was going, who did this stuff? And I found the studio and I emailed them. I said, can you come down and do our building? And he said, sure. And so that's, I hired the, the people who I thought were the best and they did a great job. So why did we feature that building? Well, I did want to build um, the best, what I considered the best eye care facility in Austin. Um, and so we bought, we invested in real estate in a nice part of Austin and we want to cater to the people who want to do um, elective surgery. And so we want to build from that and we're renovating our other offices. Um, and it, that takes a lot of hard work. Um, it, it, the only people who can do that in ophthalmology are probably people who do refractive surgery. Um, and for the next 10, 15 years, it's just to grow the business and 
uh, work with the local ophthalmology residency program that we've and, and, and teach medical students here at UT Austin and uh, and then we'll see what the future holds yeah I, yeah, I think I think that uh, you know really in my experience the best way to inspire you know hope and wisdom um, and the next generation is to talk to people who've blazed the trail ahead of us people who've made difficult choices and decisions in order to live an extraordinary life and have an extraordinary practice. And uh, from Gary and I, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Blake. Brooklyn Horns. (laughs) 